As we experience the great outdoors and marvel at its beauty, we can't help but wonder how inspiring landscapes were formed and how long it all took to happen. Through the years, we continue to develop a more profound awe for our Earth and its history, and we recognize just how short our time is to enjoy it. Hello, I'm Myron Cook. I hope you're doing well. Wherever I go, I continue to be amazed and inspired by our Earth at various levels, and one of those levels is the level of deep time. When I read an article or see an interview of a radiometric dating expert that pronounces that the Earth is billions of years old, I do experience a wow factor. It's a big number. But you know, this pales in comparison to the awe that I feel when I'm out in the field and see time with my own eyes. In this video, I hope to help you see time with your own eyes and have a deeper appreciation for the Earth in your part of the world. Of course, I've got to start with a simple sketch to help us out. Let's talk about the formation of a sedimentary basin, which would be this area here, the big low area adjacent to a mountain. And I've drawn just a simple sequence of folded layered rock, which is quite common actually. And as the basin forms, new sediment is deposited in the basin. Not surprising, is it? And we continue that process filling in the basin as it forms. But of course, erosion is important, and erosion comes in, and it starts eroding down on the top of the mountain, and keeps coming down deeper and deeper, and gets down into here, into the basin even through time. So we erode it all. Of course, what we witness is the world after this erosion, and, it's, and the erosion continues today. So I want to focus on the area right in here with a little better sketch, because this is really important to us, right here on the flank or the side of the mountain. To my slightly more detailed sketch, this would be the side of the mountain, the flank of the mountain. Main mountain here, cross-sectional view. Within the mountain, we have metamorphic rocks in this case that we'll be seeing, and the layers are dipping steeply in this direction, interestingly in the opposite direction of these. And these are the layers that existed as the mountain was uplifted and then they were eroded. At one time, they went up and over the mountain. So what geologists like to do is they'll, they'll draw a dashed line like this that goes up and over like that to show that this layer, this sequence of rocks, at one time went up and over and has subsequently been eroded. So a lot of erosion has occurred. And essentially with the erosion, we're left with this basic sketch that I've shown you here. And this is a really marvelous place to just basically go from the old rock here, go through time, looking at this se these sequences out into the basin. And the amazing thing here is that we can see all these sequences, essentially all of them, just one after another, like I've sketched here, essentially. Here is the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming, nearly completely surrounded by mountains. We'll start our journey in the amazing Wind River Canyon and then work our way out into the basin looking at the sequences. We'll make one final stop in the mountains over here. Let's start our journey by looking at these dark colored metamorphic rocks. We're going to start our journey right here with the very oldest rock. It's underneath everything. And we can see some 5,000 feet of it here. We know there's got to be more, but it goes underground where we can't see it. It's been buried some 15 miles to, to change the chemistry of the rock. It's metamorphosed. Listen to this. Wow. It's like hitting steel or quartz. And the layering of the rock is preserved, and we can see, see it dipping very steeply. So, wow, what a great way to start this trip. The red line shows the contact between the dark colored metamorphic rocks underneath it, and above it are the lighter colored sedimentary rocks. The blue lines show just how steeply dipping the layers of rock are within the metamorphic rocks, whereas the layers on top 
the sedimentary rocks are gently dipping. It turns out that this is the great unconformity, this contact, and is the most important surface on planet Earth. A quick review of the great unconformity, and as you know, I'm always talking about very horizontal deposition. Let's do that. Through time, we are putting in layers and layers of rock. In this case, it's mud mixed with fine sand. It's called a gray wacky. And then every once in a while, some volcanic uh, flows come in, volcanic lava flows and deposits. Let me put those in. Volcanic, here in red. Maybe we'll put a couple. Then more of this gray wacky. And this went on and on and on. We know that because these rocks were buried very deeply to become metamorphosed, easily 15 miles. That's, well, almost impossible to get your head around, isn't it? This mix of gray wacky and volcanics indicates that they were deposited on a volcanic island arc adjacent to the ocean, like we see here in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. Step two, we fold these rocks into large mountains. Let's do that, sketch it out. So here we are in cross-sectional view, a big old mountain. And all these layers that are within it are folded. And then it comes along the destructive power of erosion and glaciation and cuts those mountains right down to the roots. So let's do that. It is just eroding down through this mountain, through time, down, down, down we go. And creates a very flat surface and it was close to sea level. The Canadian Shield is a great example of this process. Let's take a look at the coastline of the northern Hudson Bay. The great scars created by massive glaciation are clearly visible, and it is readily apparent that these processes leveled the land right down close to sea level. What a huge amount of time this must have taken. And then finally, new sedimentation came on, on top of it, which is our next step. And this deposition just kept on going for a very long time. So we've taken these sediments, buried them, metamorphosed them, formed the mountain, eroded the mountain, put new rock on top, and finally there was another tilt of this rock to bring us to our present day. Wow, it's hard to believe how much time we could have gone through to complete this process. And what we see here in the Wind River Canyon is just a very small window into this. We see a very small piece here of just about 5,000 feet. So it's hard to imagine how much time could have passed through this process, isn't it? We see that the unconformity is gently dipping and eventually goes underground. Like I showed in my sketch, the metamorphic rocks underneath the unconformity are steeply dipping as shown by the blue lines. And if you look carefully, you can see that the layers above the unconformity are gently dipping and are quite parallel to the unconformity. To help us understand the scale of the rock formations we observe, I will place a simple sketch of the Grand Canyon on the screen. It is some 5,000 feet from the rim to the bottom. Then I will place a red line across the canyon to depict how much of the canyon would be filled with the observed rock sequence. In this case, the metamorphic rock sequence that we can observe is some 5,000 feet thick, enough to fill the entire Grand Canyon, and we're just getting started. The great unconformity is shown with this red line, and the next sequence above it is this slope former that we're interested in. It's about 1,000 feet thick. We get a nice view of this sequence looking down the river.
The thousand feet of slope former that we see in the drone video is a slope because it's more easily eroded. The more vertical cliffs tend to be uh, very resistant to erosion and hard rock. So what might we think is easily eroded? Well, mudstones and shales. In this case, it's dominated by these mudstones and shales, but there are a lot of little thin carbonate stringers. This platy material you see on the slope, fine-grained carbonates, meaning low energy. And another fun thing about these is I see evidence of worms feeding along the surface all over on these plates that we see. So we have shale interbedded with these limestone plates, or interlayered would be another word. And I can dig into here. It's fairly resistant to dig into. There's a lot of lime material in here. But then you'll hit a softer area and hit shales as well. Sometimes you'll see even some shales that have some organic material here in this section. It's so fun to just see all these worm burrows, uh, the evidence of these worms. It looks like they're, they were feeding in here yesterday. And who knows how many different mud layers that they have. I would venture to say thousands, thousands of individual layers where these worms fed along the surface. The observation that there is significant quantities of limestone mud layers indicates that these sediments were deposited in a warm ocean out far from the coast of a carbonate platform, similar to the deep waters on the horizon in this photograph. On top of the shale, we see 1,000 feet of carbonates, both dolomite and limestone, and above that, another 300 feet of red beds. The red beds are difficult to see because they are heavily vegetated, but it forms this slope where the arrow is. Let's go to the Bighorn Canyon, a drier part of the Bighorn Basin, and see these two sequences a little more closely. This area is one of my favorite hidden gems. I can go and hike there in solitude and enjoy amazing scenery and geology. The wildlife is also abundant. Bighorn sheep love to hang out in the limestone cliffs. I'm standing at the contact of the top of all these carbonates that we see in the cliff walls in the Wind River Canyon. Just amazing. All this limestone with reef material like corals, their brachiopods, crinoids, all kinds of marine life. Throughout this entire section we have this and lots of worm burrows, interestingly enough. These observations tell us that there was an amazingly beautiful carbonate platform that likely even had blue holes like we see in this photo because there are sinkholes from karsting within this sequence. And although the reef organisms were different than what we see in this modern reef, you can be sure it was just as breathtaking. It is hard to comprehend that living organisms' skeletal material build up a thousand feet of carbonate. Untold numbers of thriving marine communities flourished, then died, and then had new communities develop upon the old ones, slowly building these great deposits. The time involved for just this one sequence overwhelms me. And then above me, we have red beds. And red, whenever you see a red layer that's a persistent, consistent layer of red, that means continental deposition. Continental deposition can also be referred to as terrestrial deposition and includes deposits such as windblown or aeolian sand, uh, river deposits or playa deposits, anything that is deposited on land. However, in this unit, named the Amston Formation, there is heavy staining from the oxidized iron that colors everything red, including significant marine deposits such as these limestones shown by the arrow. 
These observations indicate that there is a complex interplay of continental and marine deposits, suggesting that deposition occurred along an arid, low-lying desert coastline. So that means that we went from beautiful open marine conditions to continental on top here. Hard to imagine, but that's what's happening. Looking up at these fascinating cliffs, I visualize an aeolian dune field near to the ocean coast. This is the Ten Sleep Formation, which is one of my favorites in that it has all the classic features we see in windblown or aeolian sand deposits. At the top of the Ten Sleep, along this boundary, marks a big change. Let's take a closer look at this interval. The combined thickness of these two units is 500 feet. Well, here we are right back into the ocean again. That's kind of hard to believe, but it's true. And how do we know that? Well, we have really nice fine-grained mud limestones here called micrite. And other limestone we see within this unit is algally bound. There's a nice piece of it here where you can see evidence of algal mats that bind things together. We have wonderful marine fossils here, like brachiopods and bryozoans. When the marine deposits are mapped within this unit, it reveals that much of Wyoming was under a sea. In the Bighorn Basin, it was a restricted sea along a desert coastline. Well, we've made it out of the canyon, and believe it or not, we've already reviewed some 7,000 feet of metamorphic and sedimentary rocks. Now we will start our traverse out into the basin, and the first layer or formation we will observe will be this iconic red bed sequence. Looking out of the canyon, we see it off in the distance. This amazing red sequence is the most iconic formation in all of the Bighorn Basin and is referred to as the Chugwater Formation and is some 900 feet thick. The dashed lines show how the formation at one time went up and over the mountain and has subsequently been eroded back to the present position. These red beds are a classical representation of continental deposition, meaning deposition of rock that is exposed to oxygen fairly often, unlike in, within the ocean, you know, where it's covered with water. So that might include things like river deposits or coastal plains near the ocean. You know, these broad, flat plains, which is more likely here for this unit here. And in this case, it's dominated by siltstone, very fine, low energy grains. Even this a uh, layer here that looks a lot like mud from a distance when you get feeling it and looking at it. It's actually a siltstone, but there are some mudstones. And then you get fine-grained sandstones. Everything we observe within these deposits indicates that they were deposited in a hot and arid, harsh desert, like parts of modern-day Egypt. One can only wonder how long it would take to deposit 800 feet of these sediments in a desert like this. It seems impossibly long to me. So there you go for the iconic Chugwater formation. At the top of the Chugwater is a unit dominated by gypsum, which is this whitish color here. It's about 100 feet thick. We can go to the modern Persian Gulf to see where gypsum forms today. Let's zoom in to this area. It forms on very hot, arid, low-relief coastal regions called sabkas. We've covered a lot of ground, so I think it'd be helpful to do a visual review of just how many changes in the Earth's depositional environments occurred through this section. As we move into the basin, we see all the great layers of tilted rock that at one time extended up and over the mountain and have since been eroded back to the present position. That must have taken a lot of time. 
The red chug water is the last one we reviewed. Now we will examine this series of formations that lie above the chug water. The next sequence of rocks is defined by the two blue lines, and the black lines show how it continued on up the flank of the mountain at a dip of about 20 degrees and then was eroded down to the current position. It has a total thickness of about 800 feet. In this area it is mostly covered by vegetation, so I want to jump to a drier part of the Bighorn Basin and show you a few details. We'll start by looking at the lower part of this interval. Well, I've made it here to a drier part of the Bighorn Basin so we can see this particular uh, unit more easily. It's dominated by shales again, muds. Very easy to dig into. This unit is, oh, at least 90% muds and with a few grainstones in them. Not siliciclastic like uh, quartz grain stones, but other types of grains that we'll talk about here in a second. But <laughs> what's really fun about this unit is I'm looking down on the ground right here, thousands of oyster shells. Just unbelievable numbers of oyster shells called gryphea is the name of them back here at this period. And in fact, this unit right here that looks kind of like a sandstone. Well, it is a grainstone, but it's primarily composed of these broken, broken up gryphea shells. And this, by the way, is the very first unit on top of the iconic red chugwater formation. And back behind me, up on the ridge here, is a whole series of oolites. Oolite shoals, I'll say. I should say a series of oolite shoals. Boy, that's probably a new word for you. I'll show you that in just a minute. Other fossils that we find in here, so we have the gryphea, we have lots of crinoids, and interestingly, we, you can go to areas where you can find bucket loads of squid fossil shells. Well, it's a bit windy out here now, so I put on my windy hat, but I wanted to show you all these belemnites I mentioned. You know, they're bucket loads of them. Let me show you what I mean. Wow, all these dark pieces in here are belemnites. They're just everywhere. Just focused in here. Everywhere you look, bucket loads and bucket loads of them. Aren't all these squid fossils, these bellumnites fun? They're just everywhere in, these, in this particular formation. And it turns out they can have, help us have a fun thought experiment. And this is to help us think about how to convert rock to time when we come up to an outcrop of rock and think about time. So let me start by talking about the squid itself. The bullet-shaped fossil we have is that we find is the shell that the animal lived within. So I've depicted that here, and I've drawn a little head with the eyes and the tentacles, and they swam around in the ocean just like modern squids do. Now here's the fun part, this thought experiment. Let's assume that you could go back in time and have your little sailboat and wander around, and it's your job to catalog at the end of every year how many squid fossils you see on the seafloor below. And being a good scientist, you decide to make a map with a nice grid. So let me draw a map. Looking down on this map, and we grid it out. I'll just put a couple squares here, not too many. So we grid it out, and you decide as the scientist, I'm going to make these 100 feet square, 100 feet on each side, each of these squares, and float around cataloging it. So the first year you find that on average that there is one dead squid in each of these um, grids. And then of course you come back the next year and assuming they die at about the same rate, now you'll have on average two, etc. Year after year. Now here's the fun part to think about this mental exercise. 
How long would it take to get the spacing down to a foot? How many years? Well, you do the math, it's fairly straightforward, and it's 10,000 years. 10,000 years to get it down to one foot spacing. Now, we out on the outcrop, what we saw were squids, you know, every few inches, these squid fossils that had died and gone to the bottom. So, boy, this is starting to get significant, isn't it? Isn't this a fun thought experiment? Now, of course, mud is also settling down as well as through this time. So let's just assume during this 10,000 year period where we get the density to down to a foot that we rain. Let me draw just a tiny little layer of mud here. This is obviously not to scale. This is six inches in this uh, imaginary world. And all these uh, squids that died that you documented over a 10,000 year period are within that mud. That seems reasonable. <clears throat> and so you have those. That means that every six inches is about 10,000 years. Now, here we go again. We've got to scale it. And you think, well, what does that mean if I have 100 feet of this? And that's not unrealistic here to have 100 feet or 50 feet of this section that has a lot of these squid fossils, these belemnites. How many years would that be? Well, six inches, 100 feet thick, 10,000 years per six inches. You figure it out, it's two million years. Wow. This is a great thought experiment because it helps us understand how easy you can get to a lot of time, a lot of years, even if everything we've done here is quite off base. This is not scientific in the strict sense, but it, but it helps us think about it. And it's directionally right. We just don't know how right. So back to the ridge behind me. As I mentioned, it is composed of oolites, which are small spherical grains of calcite. We can go to the Bahamas to see an example of oolite shoal deposition. Aren't these shoals beautiful? Offshore from these shoals in the deeper water was where the belemnite squids were happily living. Now we'll look at the upper part of the interval. I have never taken the opportunity to systematically go through all the formations like this and witness with my own eyes the full immensity of deposition, and I must say that even for a geologist it is having a big impact on me. As I drive to the next location, I marvel that we have already witnessed 8,000 feet of deposition, which is nearly two Grand Canyons. I also feel a sense of awe that we have seen metamorphic rocks in the Great Unconformity. We've seen great deposits of oceanic shale, then coastal carbonates, then land deposits like great dune fields, then back to the ocean, then land again, then to the ocean again. And to see this all firsthand is truly an amazing experience, and yet, I know there's much more to come. Beautifully colored mudstones, aren't they? Look at that, I can just drop my hammer right into it and it goes all the way up. I mean, it's super soft mudstone. And notice the coloring we see, this, this really nice coloring. Uh, you've got some purplish colors, you get red colors in here, some orange colors. And this is all suggestive of continental deposition, and, and in fact we know it is because it's the Morrison Formation. Yes, many of you will have heard of that formation name because that's where, with, along with the cloverly sitting right on top of it, those two formations are where the vast majority of the dinosaur bones that are so famous that we know about come from. So the dinosaurs were wandering around here. These mudstones didn't deposit in the ocean, rather they were depositing on uh, river floodplains. Just in your mind, think of the Mississippi River floodplain. That's a good way to think of it. And the sandstones, the higher energy sandstones, which are a minor component, um, that's where the rivers were. They were depositing these sandstones. So, for this video, I want you to think about low energy mudstones are pretty dominating, 
and then some higher energy sandstones. And so we continue. Our next sequence of rock is about 1,600 feet thick and includes this valley and the adjacent ridge. In the nice valley that we see in the drone video, the valley portion of that section of rock that I showed you, that is a dark colored shale. It's covered in vegetation in the video, so it's hard to see, but this is that shale. It's referred to as the Thermopolis shale, if you're curious. It has a dark color because it has a lot of organic material in it. We know it's marine because we find marine fossils within it like ammonites. And it's, of course, easy to dig into. This formed from mud, so it's very low energy. Mud settling in the bottom of an ocean. That's the way to think of this. Easy to dig into, and it's quite platy which is typical of marine shales. Uh, so let me show this to you close up. Nice and platy flakes that you see in the shale. Let's take a closer look at the rock in this ridge. The upper part of this section is another shale, but it's very different. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a piece that's come down. Even the smaller thin layers do the same thing. Take a listen. <laughs> it turns out this is very fine mud, but it's highly silicious. In some layers, the silica concentration is very high, and so high we call it perselenite, which is an obvious reference to porcelain. And I'll tell you, it can be like glass. I've uh, had three flat tires driving over this over the years, so and it'll just cut into your tires like a knife. So this silica is, we know it's marine. Again, we find marine organisms in here. You can find shark's teeth in here. They tend to be small ones, at least the ones I've seen. And the silica comes from um, like plankton that has silicious shells on them. They often occur in colder waters, these plankton, these silicious rich plankton. And they slowly accumulate in the ocean muds, and the silica is either preserved in the shells, or the tests we call them, or it dissolves and reprecipitates in, in silica. And so we have it here. Another fascinating thing about this unit is, believe it or not, it has a lot of oil in it. I can break this open take a smell and many times I can smell oil within the rock here. Let me show you what it looks like. Very dark color that's because of the organic content that's within this rock. Many of the layers we see in this outcrop have over 80 percent silica content. It's hard to imagine how many generations of the microscopic plankton called radiolarians there must have been to accumulate in these thicknesses. A quick visual review of the changes in the earth through the formations that we just reviewed. We just finished up with this series of formations. And now it's time to move further out into the basin into younger and younger rock. We'll start with this broad, wide valley and then work over to these ridges. Our next sequence stretches across this wide valley and is composed of this gray material. It is some 3,500 feet thick. I'll bet a lot of you know what this is. What made that broad, low valley where it's easily erodible? Yeah, you've got it right. It's shale. And it's familiar to us. It has this darker coloring that we've seen because it has organic material in it. We know it's marine because we see marine fossils within this shale. And it's some 3,500 feet thick. 
that's hard to get your head around, even for me as a geologist. It's kind of hard to get my head around thinking about this mud slowly building up in the ocean through time to get 3,500 feet or so of this, this material. One way I like to think about it is dust settling in the air, because we're kind of familiar with that. Have any of you had the opportunity to go into an old abandoned house, say, that's been abandoned 20 years and just see how much dust has accumulated? It's kind of fun to do. It's not much. And that's a good way to think of it here. Many of you are familiar with large lakes or the ocean in particular. You get very far offshore and the water becomes very clear, doesn't it? And that's where these mud particles are slowly settling down, settling down this clay material settling down through the water column and building up through time. But boy, it's such clear water and there's and, and the density of clay particles floating through the column is so very low, kind of like dust in our air. I want to expand on this topic just a little bit. There have been studies done on the depositional rates in open marine waters. For instance, there was a study released by the European Marine Observation Network that showed that in the North Atlantic, that the depositional rates range from zero to one millimeter per year. Now, a millimeter is really thin. There are 25 of them in an inch, so we're talking about really small depositional rates. Interestingly, we have an, uh, a neat data point from the Titanic, of all places. If you go and look at photographs, now unfortunately they're copy copyrighted, I can't show them to you, but you can see uh, photos of plates and things like shoes where you don't see any sediment on them at all, other than some that kind of got on them as they hit the bottom and maybe kicked up a little, and you'll see a little on one edge or something like that, but you just don't see any sediment on them. And to me, that's not surprising, uh, because you're way away from the land. There have been other studies that have shown that way out there in the abyssal depths that the sedimentation rates are less than one thousandth of a millimeter per year. So, wow, these sedimentation rates can be very low. But if we take a conservative number like a half a millimeter per year and use that to calculate how long it took the Cody Shale to deposit, uh, you can do the math on it because the Cody Shale is 3,500 feet thick and you come up with 2.1 million years. And the fun part of this is, is you get to use your experience and think about it and internalize it and use the number that you're comfortable with. And so you have this innate feeling of time and converting that thickness of sediment to time. And this is the fun part to me. I hope you're beginning to understand that you can see time by converting the rock type and the thickness of it to time. You know, I often tell people that when I go up to an outcrop of rock, especially if it's a big cliff of, of rock, a big formation or something, and I'm contemplating time, it gives me the same feelings that I get when I look into a dark, open sky and see all the stars. And that is the feeling of utter insignificance. It is quite humbling. If we take this half millimeter per year for the, the Cody Shale and use that to represent my life, my whole life occurs in just over an inch of sediment within that huge section of Cody Shale. It's really hard to fathom. I want to show you what this shale looks like if I dig into it a little. <clears throat> it's a little wet here. They had a recent rain, but if I dig in, I can get some shale here. Let me show you. So here we see it, yet again, a platy, uh, a platy shale, organic shale. The observations that we've made here in the Cody Shale inform us that the deposition of the muds occurred far offshore in the ocean.
This beautiful tall ridge that sits right on top of the Cody Shale is our next sequence. It's about 1,200 feet thick. It's alternating mudstones, shales, and sandstones. And there are carbonaceous units. In fact, coal is some places mined in this unit, as well as the next one that we'll show. But uh, as you get towards the top, it's more dominated by sandstone. Just a fantastic unit. I love this. It's called the Mesa Verde. These observations and others informed geologists that the upper sandstones of this unit were deposited on a beach and near shore environments, whereas the deeper shaley and thinly bedded units were deposited not too far offshore. A quick visual review of how our world changed through this sequence we just observed. We just reviewed this sequence. Now we will look at this section. This broad valley and ridge is yet another sequence, and it's about 1,500 feet thick. So with the drone, we've seen the next section, some 1,500 feet of section that we're seeing. And the valley that we see in the drone footage that's vegetated is primarily this material, mud. That's why it's eroding into the valley. Uh, some of it is carbonaceous. This has a little bit of a dark color to it. So that tells us it's carbonaceous. We've got some plant material in there, and it's very cyclical, as I hope you can see in some of the drone footage. You'll see cycles. In these two photos of a small portion of the overall sequence, one can plainly see many cycles of coal or carbonaceous units set within mudstones. How many cycles can you see? I would guess that if you counted all the cycles in the entire sequence, it would easily be more than a hundred. And then we have a mix of the mud and the deposition of the sandstone. And we see the sandstones towards the upper part. So we have our sandstones here, which we see in the drone, that, that continue on up to, to my left, the valley out to my right. With the presence of carbonaceous layers, coal, mud, and sandstones, we can deduce that this sequence was deposited in a swampy coastal environment. Moving along, we've reviewed this uh, sequence here that was deposited in this coastal swampy environment. Now let's go further on out to the next big sequence. Are you beginning to wonder if we will ever make it through all the formations? This sequence covers a very large area because it is thick and the slopes or the dips of the rock are lower. The base of this sequence is this red line and extends way, way over to the left here. Finally, we arrive to the other side, the top. It's a big one at 5,000 feet thick. Boy, this is exciting to show you these beautiful exposures of this sequence. This, all this mudstone, oh boy, more mudstone. But we have cycles of, of coaly or woody material that's very carbon rich that develops into coal. If it's not, if it's poorly developed, I like to say coaly. But uh, at any rate, uh, we see three cycles right here, right with me. It's very soft mud, the vast majority of this sequence. I drop my hammer in, it just, my hammer almost disappears. It weathers very softly, completely dominated by this. There's some sandstones from river channels, but other than that, not much. So these muds are not marine muds. They're continental deposition, and we can be confident of that because we have coal. We just have layer after layer after layer, or cycle upon cycle, of these coaly units. Sometimes just a thin little coal streak, or a thin little carbon-rich streak, just a slight dark band, and other times beautiful big coals that are developed here. 
Uh, it's very economic in some areas where you have thick coal beds within this uh, sequence. The mental picture I like to paint in my mind are these swampy forests that develop. And if they develop for a long time in big thick layers of peat, they can actually develop good layers of coal or everything in between. Sometimes they don't get to grow very long and then mud comes in and kills it all off and the cycle starts over and it just keeps going over and over and over again. That's kind of hard to get your head around. How many times the forest died out and then came back into being for good periods of time to develop these coaly layers. Wow. As we enjoy this drone shot of just 500 feet of this formation, we can see many cycles of coal and carbonaceous layers. Studies have shown that that peat forms at about 2 inches per 10 years and that it takes about 8 feet of peat for 1 foot of coal. This information reveals to us that it takes approximately 480 years to form 1 foot of coal. There is so much time passing before our eyes in this drone video. Our next formation sits on top of this sequence and we can see it way out in the distance where you see a little bit of red and some rugged topography. That's where we're going next. Well, we've made it to my most special place. These beautiful badlands are where my great uncle Cliff introduced me to geology. It has been nearly 25 years since he passed. I wish I could have one more day with him out here. This sequence is 3,000 feet thick and is the youngest sedimentary layer preserved in the basin. But I do have one more amazing sequence to show you. But first, let's talk about these wonderful badlands. Boy, we've seen this color before, haven't we? Yeah, we're seeing these red colors and violet colors. So it's telling us it's continental, and in fact it is. And we've sure seen a lot of mudstone like this, this really soft mudstone. And uh, here we go again, 90% very fine particles, mudstone, just a little bit of sandstone associated with the actual river channels. These are ancient river deposits. These are the flood plains where you get all this mud. So a muddy system, kind of like the modern day Mississippi River. Uh, these rivers wouldn't have been that big, but the nice flood plains with lots of mud. So by my count, we've already gone through 25,300 feet of, of sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. That's five Grand Canyons. And we still have one more special section to come. And you know, that seems like a really deep basin, 25,000 feet. But you know, the Arcoma Basin in Oklahoma has 40,000 feet. And uh, basins get deeper. The North Caspian Basin has some 65,000 feet of sediment within it, and there's several that are very deep like that. It turns out that there are about 800 sedimentary basins across the world, and each one has their own story to tell. And when you think about what's in there and all the different layers and depositional environments and from the ocean to land and back and forth, it just it just amazes me. It just utterly amazes me. And I hope you're starting to get a sense of how, how to see this deep time and how it's just, well, rather mind-boggling. Even more mind-boggling than a giant number like four billion years. After all, that's just a number, you know, that we look at. My excitement grows as I hike ever closer to a very different sequence of rocks that recorded the final deposition in this region, volcanic rocks.
These amazing deposits came from a series of great strata volcanoes that towered over the landscape. Much has been eroded away, but here there is easily 4,500 feet preserved. I know of at least 20 different layers of petrified trees within these deposits, and I'm sure there are many more. Through the lens of geology, we have witnessed huge changes in our Earth and massive amounts of time. Let's do a quick visual review of it all. Walking along, I reflect on the astounding history of our Earth. It makes me feel so small and insignificant, yet somehow brings me peace. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video, and thank you for watching.